Well, eagles depend on 70% of their diet from fish, 30% on waterfowl. Neither option is open when the seas are this rough. Even so, eagles will still cruise for opportunities that might surface. This is the year old fledgling I named Iris. Iris the messenger from Greek mythology. I know it's her due to her unique feather pattern. Iris flew past my window so often, I felt like I was the bird in a cage. I started setting up my camera in the living room so I could film her as she went by. Yet even at that, often I'd only get a brief glimpse. Iris really had my attention though, as this is November, so I'm really the only human around as these neighborhoods are summer vacation homes and cottages. They sit empty most of the year, so each day I'd see more eagles than I would humans. Frank is one of the top eagle experts in North America. He was gracious enough to take me on a field survey to learn how he works with eagles. His final report covers 30 years of eagle breeding cycles and behaviors of eagle territories across the entire state of Oregon. But like other eagle experts I've met, he'll be quick to warn anyone not to make assumptions about eagles. Frank also showed me some slides of eagles that are 
have been shot by hunters. This one got blasted with a shotgun. It didn't kill the eagle, but certainly put it in a lot of pain. This eagle was electrocuted, which is a big problem up where I live. As in 2018, over 70 eagles were electrocuted to death. Also part of Frank's job is to train volunteers to watch eagles and to monitor their nests. I went to an eagle festival in central Oregon and this was about as close as I ever got to an eagle. Which is vastly different from the eagle habitat where I'm used to hanging out. Here in eagle territory will probably be one every three to four miles. As where I live, there's 15 eagles nests in five square miles. The main reason is because of the food supply. I also discovered that, like me, Frank likes to put his field notes in a written handbook that's bound so it can't be lost or it won't disappear on some broken hard drive. This is one of the first things, one of the things we learned in forestry summer school when I went to college was how to use compass and bearing to pace and define units of land. Okay, white spot. A technique of figuring out where something is with a compass is, you know, ages old. Ever since people had a map and a compass, they've been doing this. A GPS unit makes it really easy because you can know exactly where you are. And then you use a compass and uh, shoot a bearing to what you're looking at and get use that bearing laid on top of your uh, point, your position you get with your GPS unit. And then if you have a topographic map that shows the cliff, you can basically draw a line from your um, location to the nest location on the cliff. Um, one line is not real accurate. If you really want to get an accurate location, you do what's called triangulation. And you do two or three or four from four different locations. And then when all the lines cross, is close to where you're trying to figure out. So... So it's a rough, uh, gives you a pretty rough but uh, useful estimate of a nest location on a cliff. I also wanted to mention that most of the times I go out to observe eagles, not much happens. They're just sitting around because there's no wind or whatever. But what keeps me coming back week after week, year after year, is that special day when you see something like this. Here a group of eagles are playing a form of rugby where one eagle has an object like a ball and the other eagles are chasing it. There you saw one drop it and another one intercept it. There another one drags on the eagle hoping it'll drop it. But it's all in good fun and after about three or four minutes of this they'll all disperse and go back to their respective perches.